Greetings and salutations, everyone. My name is Andrew Kirkoff, and welcome to my YouTube channel. Today, I'm going to be reviewing the heavy running back draft strategy. And for those of you who aren't familiar, this entails selecting three running backs within your first four selections. Now, about a week ago, I went ahead and put out a draft strategy video that entailed the idea of selecting two running backs within your first three selections. And though I think that really does help set you up for success, and throughout that video, I review the statistics that gives us the confidence in executing said strategy, this takes it the next step further, you are adding to your running back depth in the fourth round and building a heavy stable of workhorse guys that could potentially help you win a 2022 fantasy football championship. I've gone ahead and I've selected two teams via underdog with this given strategy. I'll of course share with you guys my perspective and give you insight as to how I thought my respective drafts went. But the entire point is to give you guys another sample of a different draft strategy. Like I've mentioned in the past, you can win fantasy football leagues with any draft strategy you'd like i just want to continue to give you guys more and more samples of drafts give you more intel regarding them so that you have all the required information that you'll need to make the right decisions on draft day and help yourself win a 2022 fantasy football championship now again like i mentioned we'll be reviewing two drafts that i went ahead and did via underdog fantasy in the last couple days Again, for those of you who have not yet checked it out already, Underdog Fantasy is another way to go ahead and prepare for your leagues via their Best Ball Mania drafts, the Puppy drafts. You can go ahead, sign up today using promo code Andrew. Again, I've mentioned this in the last couple of days. If you guys go ahead and sign up today using promo code Andrew, Underdog Fantasy is not only willing to match up to $100 of your first deposit. Again, you deposit $100, they'll match that and get you ready to go for your upcoming draft season. But that's not the only thing that you'll be getting if you use promo code Andrew today. It also includes my 2022 fantasy football draft rankings for a half and full PPR scoring system. Now, what exactly does that mean? When you sign up using promo code Andrew, I will personally send you an email with both my half and full PPR rankings, quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end, kicker, and defensive positions by tier, along with my top 200 flex players. And you're not only just going to get those rankings a day after you sign up, You'll also get it on a weekly basis updated so that all of August you have my updated rankings in order to help you with your upcoming draft, whether it is via Underdog Fantasy or your home leagues. So you're ready to go and ready for success. Also, another way to support the channel, of course, clicking the like button down below, commenting down below, and subscribing. We are on our way to 60K subscribers. Help us reach that goal. It's another milestone that we're looking to get to. Greatly appreciate it. We're making fantasy football content for the entirety of the 2022 season on a daily basis. So if you're interested, be sure to go ahead and subscribe. Thank you. All right, let's talk about this. Again, there are a couple of prerequisites before we get into drafting and giving some analysis as to how you can execute a heavy running back draft strategy. Now, in all of the drafts I have conducted this offseason, uh, there have been multiple times that I've been presented the opportunity to select a third running back potentially in my third or fourth rounds but i haven't always taken that opportunity because again approaching a draft you typically want to have a balanced team but when you get into a third or fourth round where yes you may have already selected two running backs in your first two potential picks but a running back that is in your third or fourth round shouldn't be there they've somehow some way fallen to you i found myself sitting there and thinking man it would be really difficult for me to let this player go. I think they're far too valuable to let another team get to. And the substitution of grabbing a wide receiver or another position at this point just wouldn't suffice. So you go ahead and you select that third running back. Now, typically, this has happened to me in draft where I'm selecting from the sixth pick through the 12th pick. The reason why that takes place is because you typically want to get to your fourth round as fast as you possibly can. Because... Again, when you are selecting from 6 through 12, you are guaranteeing two of the top 12 running backs are going to be on your roster. In the third round, what often happens is you'll be able to get a low-end wide receiver one. Players like A.J. Brown, T. Higgins, Michael Pittman Jr., Keenan Allen, and of course, Mike Williams. So there's a multitude of players that you can go after in that third round at the wide receiver position to set you up. You're settled for your first three picks, but then the question remains, how do you get to the point of selecting a running back in that fourth round? Well, if there is a player available in your fourth round that you believe is far too valuable to pass up on and go ahead and draft another player instead of them, then you should take them. In this case, on the draft that you see on screen, I went ahead, I selected Najee Harris, Joe Mixon, 
Michael Williams in the third round, and Ezekiel Elliott was somehow, some way, still available in the fourth round. Now, I'll go ahead and I'll give you a comprehensive breakdown as to why I made those specific decisions, but I also want to give you some understanding as to what exactly the drop-off in production is at the running back position. When I've gone ahead and I've taken all of the total statistics in terms of fantasy points scored, from the top 32 running backs, wide receivers, and tight ends over the last five years and average those out, that the stability in terms of weekly production at the running back position begins to fall off relatively quickly. Now, when we look at the top 12 overall running backs, obviously these top tier players are workhorse backs, guys that are touching the ball and give, being given 20 or more opportunities in a week. But eventually, once we get to RB 17, 18, 19, 20, all the way down to 32. The separation between those respective running backs and the available wide receivers that are often there is a pretty big difference. And if you can go ahead and stack up on solid running backs that are going to hit for you in your early rounds, the stud wide receivers that will be potentially available in your later rounds can certainly help you find success. And that also aligns with tight ends. If you're able to grab stud running backs early, you may be able to also substitute a running back that you would have taken later with a stud tight end that can help you lead to success. But we've gone ahead and we've reviewed the drop off in production and the running back dead zone in the prior video that I was mentioning earlier. If you guys want to go ahead and check that video out, again, the thumbnail is as such on the channel. Check that out. There's a lot of information and statistics in regarding these respective drafts. So if you're interested, thank you very much. All right, let's get into this respective draft. I was given the number 11 overall selection, the 1.11. And with my selection, I wanted to go ahead and solidify the running back position. And that's exactly what I did. I took my highest ranked available running back, which is Najee Harris. Again, if you want some more insight regarding Najee Harris, I've talked about him already in a video this offseason in terms of my top 12 overall running backs. He had 381 total touches last year. He is a workhorse back. The offense is going to continue to run through him in 2022 regardless of who is under center again ben roethlisberger wasn't the best quarterback last year if you go ahead and just break out the overall stats in terms of running back production with and without ben roethlisberger over the last three plus years we found that running backs produce more fantasy points per week when there is no ben roethlisberger and not only that it has just been a part of the culture for the pittsburgh steelers to have a dominant force in their backfield over the course of the last eight seasons we have seen six pittsburgh steelers running backs finished as the number six overall running back in fantasy or better in their given season. Only twice have we ever seen a Pittsburgh Steelers running back fall short of that in the last eight years. It was 2019 and 2020 when James Conner went down with his respective injuries those two years. But outside of that, when we've had healthy running backs, D'Angelo Williams, Le'Veon Bell, and Najee Harris in this backfield, even James Conner had himself one of those top six seasons. When we've had healthy production in this backfield, we found ourselves a lot of success. But Either way, moving on from Najee Harris, we talk about Joe Mixon, the next highest ranked player on my board that is available at the running back position. I want to go ahead and I want to gather workhorse level running backs, players that are going ahead and getting themselves upwards of 20 opportunities a game. And that's exactly what Joe Mixon has done. Since week eight of the 2019 season, in the last 31 games that Joe Mixon has played, he's not only averaged 16.42 fantasy points per game, he's averaged 22.67 opportunities and 22.19 touches per game that is elite level production and obviously based on the production that he provided for our fantasy teams last year and that's what we're going to continue to see in 2022 so after my first two round selections i've gone ahead and solidified my running backs like i mentioned you want to typically go ahead and draft the wide receiver that you believe has wide receiver one upside in this specific case i have an opportunity to select mike williams Mike Williams was a wide receiver one last year. He set career highs in targets, receptions, receiving yards, was one touchdown away from his career high in re uh, receiving touchdowns. We've talked about him at nauseum this offseason. He is an incredible wide receiver, and he is associated with one of the top five offenses in the national football league with a young up-and-coming stud quarterback with an improved offensive line, improved defense, and probably more targets going in his direction this year. Let's not forget Mike Williams had a bit of an injury midway through that season that kind of slowed him down. But in the end, he was available and he helped our teams win games. Now, after I selected my wide receiver one, I somehow, someway got into the fourth round 
And I thought to myself, wow, the guy that's next to me has really gifted me this running back. Now, in my opinion, Ezekiel Elliott most likely should have been taken, but that wasn't the case. The player next to me was somehow, some way going with a different strategy. It's not for me to question. It's for me to evaluate those selections and make the best decision for my team. So what I went ahead and did was select my highest running back that was available on the board. And in my opinion, Ezekiel Elliott in a fourth round selection is a bargain. Again, throughout his entire career in the National Football League, he has always been a top 12 fantasy running back. Even in his worst years without Dak, even in the year in which he was suspended after playing the first 10 weeks of the season, he has always been a top 12 player. And I understand the hesitation of buying in on Zeke. But let's not forget, prior to his injury last year in which he tore his PCL, from weeks 1 through 6, he was averaging 17.77 fantasy points per game while averaging 19.67 touches and 72% of the offensive snaps. And over the course of the second half of the season, weeks 8 through 17, obviously, we had 7 performances of less than 10 fantasy points and a half PPR. But it wasn't like Tony Pollard was playing more or getting more touches. This wasn't the case. It was just a matter of this offense not being able to lean into Ezekiel Elliott as much. And what the Dallas Cowboys had to do was substitute those opportunities they would have typically given to Ezekiel Elliott and given it to another receiving option because I can assure you it didn't go in the direction of Tony Pollard on a weekly basis. His averages, in fact, dropped from weeks 8 through 17 compared to weeks 1 through 6. With that all being mentioned, I really do believe Ezekiel Elliott is a bargain in the fourth round. And I've gone ahead and for the first four rounds of my draft, secured the running backs that will really just carry my team. I'm going to win or lose based on their contributions. And every subsequent player that I select is obviously going to help me accomplish that goal. But these three players are my workhorse backs. They fill my two starting running back positions and my flex. And hopefully, if they'll continue to play as well as they have in seasons past, I should be in a great position. Now, as the fourth round disappears and the fifth round presents itself, the conversation begins as to when am I going to address my second wide receiver position? Looking at my draft board, as I was drafting, I saw, okay, obviously the team that was at the 1.12 position started with tight end and three wide receivers. He did not address the running back position. So my assumption is he is most likely either going to address both running back positions right now or one of them. It would be very unlikely and very unwise of him to take another wide receiver. But again, there's always a possibility of him doing so. With Darren Waller available on the board at 5.11. I mean, I can't even believe that I was able to get Darren Waller this late. I 100% had to grab him. Because not only is he a steal at 5.11, uh, there's always a possibility that the team to the right of me maybe snags him. Maybe wants to double up on tight end. You never know. Play one in the flex. Play one as their starting tight end. You never know. But either way, Darren Waller, absolute steal. When we look at his 2021 statistics in comparison to his 2020 statistics, in the first nine weeks of the 2021 season, Darren Waller had almost identical statistics in terms of targets, receptions, receiving yards, and receiving touchdowns to 2020. And we all remember that 2020 year being incredible for him. But let's put it in perspective. Weeks 1 through 11, prior to Darren Waller's injury, he was the number three overall tight end in fantasy. And now, going into 2022, we're adding more offensive weapons like Devontae Adams. You're bringing in Josh McDaniels, a absolute genius in terms of an offensive coordinator's mind, who is going to lead this offense in the right direction. Again, if we go ahead and look at the history of Josh McDaniels and his respective tight ends, going back till 2012, I mean, again, the New England Patriots have always wanted to use Rob Gronkowski, Aaron Hernandez, and most recently, the combination of Johnu Smith and Hunter Henry. From 2012 through 2017, the tight end position on a per-year basis for the New England Patriots saw 151 targets a year. Last season with the New England Patriots, their tight ends combined for 120 targets, 78 receptions, 897 yards, and 10 receiving touchdowns. Again, we know that the New England Patriots prioritize this. Josh McDaniels is from that tree and is going to continue to involve his respective tight ends, whether it is Darren Waller, of course, I'm sure Foster Moreau will play that second role in 12 personnel, but Darren Waller, I mean, he is a wide receiver. He's going to be used as such, even though he is just as adept to run blocking and staying on the field, playing over 70% of the offensive snaps in every single game he has played in his career with the Las Vegas Raiders, except for the one he got injured against the Dallas Cowboys. Obviously, we expect big things from him. We make our selection of Darren Waller, and the team to the right of me, as I suspected, took two running backs. That leads me to 
of course, addressing my wide receiver positional need because I've yet to do so. If I am playing in a league which I'm required to start three starting wide receivers, I have already taken a huge discount because in the fourth and fifth rounds, I've ignored that. But when I looked at all of the available names at the wide receiver position, I was comfortable getting any of these players in the respective sixth round because I knew the talent in comparison to the earlier rounds was a pretty relative drop. Now, Amon Ross St. Brown is a wide receiver I'm excited about. And having him as my wide receiver too isn't the most exciting thing. But in comparison, when you look at the rest of my team, having three stud running backs, a stud number one wide receiver, and one of the top four to five tight ends going into the 2022 year, I'm willing to take the discount in my wide receiver two position in a half PPR scoring format because I know Amon Ross St. Brown, though he had a huge push late last season, He's going to get work in 2022. Again, for those of you who do not remember and weren't carried by Amon Ross St. Brown last year in the NFL playoffs, from weeks 13 through 18, he averaged 20.93 fantasy points per game in a six-game span. In those six games, he had Jared Goff start for four of them and Tim Boyle as a starter for the other two. He was only behind Devontae Adams and Cooper Cup in terms of fantasy points per game throughout that span of time last season. Amon Ross St. Brown is a special player. And I understand the conversation of there was no Hawkinson, there was no Swift, and now we're adding Jamison Williams, DJ Chark, the potential of player like Amon Ross St. Brown getting limited targets in comparison to what he saw last season where he was getting 10 plus targets for six consecutive games. I understand the argument, but I, I seriously do think that he could be the Keenan Allen of this offense. And they're going to have to consistently throw the ball. And as long as Jared Goff continues to throw in his direction and believes that that is his safety blanket, I think Amon Ross St. Brown can certainly suffice as my wide receiver too. Now, as the draft progresses, we get into the seventh round. And the quarterback position came off really quickly. And the fact that I found myself sitting in a position where, wow, okay, Tom Brady and Russell Wilson just came off the board in front of me. A couple selections prior to that, Trey Lance, Jalen Hurts, Kyle and Murray. All those quarterbacks disappear, yet Joe Burrow is still available for me. Okay. Everyone's making my selections relatively easy in this regard because we're talking about Joe Burrow, who had 4,600 passing yards last year, 36 passing touchdowns, now gets a completely revitalized and retooled offensive line. If you guys don't remember, last year, Joe Burrow was the most sacked quarterbacks in the National Football League with 70 sacks given up by his offensive line. We, we saw it in the NFL playoffs against the Titans, sacked nine times in that game. He was sacked seven times in the Super Bowl against the Los Angeles Rams. He was the most accurate starting quarterback in terms of a passing completion percentage last year, despite all the pressure he faced in the pocket, still managed to have a 70.3% passing completion percentage. In an adjusted rate, it was 79%, meaning that 9% of his incompletions were on the fault of a respective offensive lineman or a respective receiver. You know, drops, batted down balls, etc. Throw away passes uh, because nobody's open. And imagine if we get into a scenario where Joe Mixon doesn't score 16 touchdowns. Even though I have Joe Mixon on this team, I'm ensuring that if those touchdowns aren't being gathered by my Joe Mixon in this lineup, I have the ability to recoup them with the value of Joe Burrow. So I take Joe Burrow here. I follow up with a couple more selections. Obviously, I need to retool my receiver position. I need three studs. Though I'm not going to get that here, and though that wasn't available to me, I still think I can find a lot of production in the later rounds. I'm going to take Chris Olave here in the eighth round. In comparison to some of the other available wide receivers, Christian Kirks, Tyler Lockett, Hunter Renfro's, I could have went elsewhere. I mean, Hunter Renfro is a, a potential option there, but I already had Darren Waller. Don't want to double dip into a singular offense, which again, there's only one ball, and there's a Devontae Adams that I'm certainly worried about taking majority of those targets from those respective players so we go ahead we grab a rookie wide receiver and we close out the first nine rounds of this respective draft by taking kenneth walker if you haven't seen my must draft player video that i uh, dropped yesterday with trey lance on the thumbnail be sure to check that out the first player that i cover in that video is kenneth walker a lot of people gotta start looking at him more as a lottery ticket rather than a player that can immediately start for you and i understand Grabbing a lottery ticket may be difficult, but in this current scenario where I have three stud running backs already selected, it's far easier for me to invest in a player like Kenneth Walker in my ninth round. 
All right, now that we've gone ahead and reviewed this draft, be sure to let me know down in the comment section what you guys think of the execution of this draft. Is starting three running backs within your first four picks optimal in 2022? Based on what I am looking at, I mean, I, I really think it is great. In the, If I'm not mistaken, in the 10th round of this draft, I don't have it on the screenshot, I did take Tyler Boyd. I went ahead and I went back to the Joe Burrow uh, well because, again, man's going to be throwing 40-plus touchdowns this year. I'm sure Tyler Boyd will be able to benefit from that. Nonetheless, let's go ahead and let's review the next draft in which I selected a very similar-looking team in terms of heavy running back draft strategy. All right, so as you can see on screen, I selected this draft from the 1.06 position. Again, like I mentioned earlier, one of the prerequisites to executing this strategy was making sure that your selection was from the 6th to the 12th overall pick because you want to go ahead and get to that 4th round as quick as you possibly can because you want to get, for example, Travis Etienne, James Conner, Ezekiel Elliott. These are running backs that are often selected in the 4th round of my underdog drafts that I want to go ahead and grab before they're gone. So in this respective draft, I went ahead, I took Derrick Henry, with my first pick because again of the available players he's my highest ranked player in a half ppr scoring format i mean what what much more do i need to say besides the fact that in the eight games that he played last year he was averaging 23.04 fantasy points per game he was getting himself 27 touches per game on average just on the ground via rushing attempts and he was on pace for setting career highs in all four receiving statistics targets receptions receiving yards and receiving touchdowns in 2021 yet his broken foot pretty much derailed his whole season. I still think Derrick Henry is an elite level talent and needs to be treated as such. Therefore, I took him. Going into my second round selection, from picks 1.06 to 1.12, I am guaranteed two of the top 12 overall running backs on my rankings list. Again, if you want my rankings, be sure to check out Underdog Fantasy. Use promo code Andrew. I'll send you that email with my updated rankings uh, You know, about a day after you sign up, after I'm given uh, the respective information to send it your direction. But nonetheless... I wanted to go ahead, lock up another one of my top 12 running backs. Leonard Fournette, welcome to the squad. Again, Leonard Fournette is a stud back that from weeks 4 through 14 of the 2021 season, in the 11 healthy games that he played, he was averaging 19.56 fantasy points per game. And throughout that span of time, was averaging over 6 targets and 5 receptions per game. We know that Leonard Fournette is a stud talent. The biggest concern around him is whether or not he could stay healthy for a full year. And of course, throughout a draft, you have to draft insurance. You have to draft guys like a Keyshawn Vaughn or Rashad White that would respectively fill in for him. But we'll talk about getting handcuffs in future videos. Nonetheless, we've gone ahead and we've selected our two stud running backs. As I'm sure you know from the formula, you want to go ahead and go after a potential wide receiver one in your third round. Of the available, I didn't want to go ahead and get Mike Williams once again, even though you're fully welcome to draft any one of these players. I personally wanted to go ahead and diversify a little bit. So I took Michael Pittman Jr. for the Indianapolis Colts. We talked about him the other day. Again, he is the number one wide receiver in a Matt Ryan-led offense. Over the course of Matt Ryan's career, his number one wide receivers have always averaged close to near 150 targets per game and a lot of stats that follow accordingly so i mean i'm pretty excited about michael pittman jr's overall potential considering how much success he found with carson wentz and how much of a better quarterback matt ryan is going into 2022 and then we talk about our fourth round selection again very similar we want to go ahead and select the running back that really should not be available in the fourth who is still a workhorse player therefore we took ezekiel elliott and then the question remains what is going to arrive in that fifth round is a tight end going to fall to me Am I interested in going in, in that direction or can a wide receiver that I'm comfortable grabbing as my wide receiver to arrive? In fact, it did. In yesterday's video, I talked about Michael Thomas at an extended rate, but I 100% implore you to go check that out. Again, a lot of people are sleeping on Michael Thomas, but there's a reason why over the course of the last two weeks, his ADP has gone from being in the eighth round to the fifth round in underdog drafts. Whether it's me selecting him or other teams selecting him, he is back and definitely in that wide receiver two conversation in 2022 after my michael thomas selection i went ahead and i invested in the quarterback position i could have gone anywhere but of the available wide receivers that there were still on the board elijah moore drake london devonta smith brandon Ayuk, i wasn't too comfortable with one of them so i wanted to go ahead and then i wanted to draft a quarterback but before i took specifically jalen hurts i had the idea in my mind 
that yes, I haven't gone ahead and I haven't selected my respective tight end. I kind of want to pair those together. So I went ahead and I took Jalen Hurts with the idea that I want to make sure that I grab Dallas Goddard in future rounds and pair those two up as a potential stack for my roster. Nonetheless, I take Jalen Hurts. We've talked about him in weeks past. He's one of the best young, talented quarterbacks. And I understand he is quite inaccurate. But when you give him a far more improved team in 2022 with far more experience, not only under Nick Sirianni's tutelage, you know, th this will be the second year in this respective offense. He won't be learning. He will be adjusted to it. You get year two Devonta Smith. You get A.J. Brown. You get an offensive line that will be far healthier than it was last season. You'll get Jalen Hurts, who will be far healthier than he was last year. If you guys don't remember, he did miss a couple games in the second half of that season in which he had a busted ankle. While over the course of the first half of the year, he was amongst the top three quarterbacks in fantasy scoring. So nonetheless, we take Jalen Hurts and we follow up the next round, taking one of my breakout wide receivers of the 2022 season, Alan Lazard. I was comfortable in the idea that a lot of other fantasy teams in my respective draft are not going to want Alan Lazard. I get that. A lot of people aren't interested with the selection, but I myself love the idea of taking the number one wide receiver in an Aaron Rodgers-led offense. Again, we talked about how much success those wide receivers find in my uh, 2022 breakouts video. But not only that, we talked about how rookie wide receivers with the Green Bay Packers since 2008 have found no success. And though there's a lot of hype regarding Christian Watson and Romeo Dobbs, I mean, it looks like this is going to be an offense that is led by Alan Lazard in terms of total targets. Moving on, we go ahead and we take Dallas Goddard in our eighth round. This was going to be one of my final potential opportunities to ensure that I get one of these middle tier tight ends. Of course, pairing him up with Jalen Hurts, then following in my next round with Kenneth Walker, similar to the way I did in the prior draft. Hopefully this gives you some perspective as to what you can potentially do when a stud running back falls to you in the fourth round. Now, I didn't want to try this respective draft by going three consecutive running backs first, second, and third rounds because I really do think that the depth in which you have at wide receiver really begins to fall apart when you go ahead and ignore that wide receiver selection in the third round because we're grabbing players that have top 12 upside, maybe even potentially better than that in 2022. So it solidifies that position and then allows us to support that with a Michael Thomas and Alan Lazard and multiple other receivers in further rounds. Either way, that was the heavy RB draft strategy for the 2022 fantasy football season. Let me know what you guys think of this strategy. Is this something that you're interested in using in your upcoming drafts? If so, hopefully this gave you a little bit of insight as to the type of rosters you can build and some of the pitfalls that you can potentially avoid in regards to when and where you should be addressing tight end, quarterback, and of course, the wide receiver position, which you'll definitely need to address quickly and often uh, unless you are okay with the available wide receivers that are in the bunch post eighth round. Either way, I want to thank you guys for watching. Be sure to check out Underdog Fantasy. Use promo code Andrew today when you do so. Underdog Fantasy is, of course, willing to match up to $100 of your first deposit, but I'm going to be sending you my draft rankings for a half full PPR scoring format. All of that information in the description and in the pinned comment down below in the comment section thank you everybody for watching click the like button and until tomorrow i'll see you guys peace